Um, so I, I want to thank uh, all the, uh, the speakers who have uh, uh, shown all the data that I'm going to show you. Uh, no, I, I'm actually going to show you some, uh, some, some uh, slides, some data that uh, uh, has not been published or made available uh, on this trial uh, and put it together hopefully so that um, you can um, appreciate what uh, we think is happening with remote ischemic preconditioning as a potential way of preventing acute kidney injury. Uh, I want to note that um, we use a biomarker in this, uh, in this trial, uh, and it uh, is uh, uh, one produced by um, Astute Medical, and I uh, have obtained grant support and funding uh, from Astute. More importantly, perhaps, uh, both the University of Pittsburgh and the University of Munster have uh, filed together with Astute Medical uh, on the use of the biomarker in conjunction with uh, RIPC for therapies to uh, prevent uh, AKI. So I mentioned earlier that um, these, um, these molecules were uh, part, and only part, because I think that, that we now recognize that this is a complex, uh, as most biological systems are, complex system whereby a number of uh, processes which defend the cell, uh, proximal tubular epithelial cells, distal tubular epithelial cells in particular, and even crosstalk between those cells has been shown uh, quite well by Pierre Degger's uh, work, um, that there is a defense mechanism that is engaged, and we don't fully understand the mechanism, but uh, clues to its importance uh, come from the fact that the cells downregulate their metabolism, they stop uh, solute transport uh, or slow it way down, and they go into a, uh, a almost a hibernation of sorts uh, where they stay out of the cell cycle. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a protective mechanism. And as Ravi correctly pointed out, it has the po possibility of progressing to a maladaptive mechanism. So if you don't come back out of cell cycle, you stay in cell cycle arrest too long, and you don't go back into the cell cycle, you run the risk of going into a senescent phenotype where you attract fibroblasts. And we know this, of course, as chronic kidney disease. So, can we potentially stimulate this response? Can we, in essence, trick the kidney into initiating these responses, not when there is a nephrotoxic exposure like cardiothoracic surgery or intermittent hemodialysis, I suppose? Um, can, we, uh, can we stimulate this response to protect the cells and get them to engage in this auto-protective response that they have. And obviously, uh, the cell cycle arrest biomarkers are measuring something that includes cell cycle arrest, but it's not the cell cycle arrest that's protective, only about, in this particular case, only about 1% of all the renal tubular epithelial cells are in cell cycle at any given time. So it's not as though there's a whole bunch of cells rapidly reproducing themselves, and as soon as they stay out of that, they do better. It's just part of an overall repertoire of response, and it's the signal that we can detect. So can we use this biomarker as a theragnostic, and can we use the intervention, remote ischemic preconditioning, in a novel way to protect the kidney rather than protect other organs such as the heart where it was initially developed. And there's some evidence um, that this is in fact uh, possible. This is uh, from uh, a, a year ago uh, in which a uh, randomized, in which a uh, meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials showed a near uh, significant signal. The uh, confidence interval crosses one, but you can see that there's a relative risk reduction uh, a, um, uh, a, an overall risk ratio of 0.7 uh, there with um, uh, a, a bit of heterogeneity, but nevertheless, there is, uh, uh, appears to be a potential signal. Now, the heterogeneity in these trials is important, too, because as I'm going to show you, it appears that this protective intervention is limited in its efficacy to those patients who respond to the intervention in a way that 
looks like they are protecting themselves if you don't increase your protective mechanisms, then you don't actually benefit from this intervention, and that may well uh, allow us to understand better uh, whether or not this intervention can, be wor can work for all patients or just a, uh, a subset of patients who are capable of responding. So um, this is the trial that was uh, published uh, just a few weeks ago in, um, uh, in JAMA, and the data were presented uh, simultaneously uh, in London at the uh, uh, EDTARA uh, meeting. Um, to go over the trial, the uh, inclusion criteria are fairly standard, uh, age uh, greater than or equal to 18 years, cardiac surgery, co-patients, uh, at very high risk, it says high risk there, but it really should say very high risk for acute kidney injury, we used the Cleveland Clinic Foundation score of greater than or equal to six. Now, only about 8 to 10% of all patients who undergo cardiac surgery in the United States have a Cleveland Clinic score greater than or equal to 6. So this is a very high-risk subset in which the predicted rate of acute kidney injury by KDGO criteria approaches 50% in this particular uh, group of patients. And the other requirement was that they received a uh, cardiopulmonary bypass. So this was excluding patients who had off-pump uh, procedures. The exclusion criteria, in addition to the off-pump uh, cases, were also patients that had prior myocardial uh, infarction, patients that had pre-existing AKI, kidney transplant, chronic kidney disease uh, uh, with a uh, uh, EGFR less than 30, uh, peripheral vascular disease affecting the upper limbs, uh, such that uh, the uh, intervention couldn't be applied safely, L uh, drug therapy with uh, sulfonamides or, uh, uh, or uh, nicoretal, which causes, uh, which atten essentially uh, attenuates the beneficial effect of the RIPC. The intervention is shown here along with the study flow. The uh, patients were block randomized uh, and allocated uh, stratified by center. Uh, in uh, four centers in Germany with induction of anesthesia. Uh, right after induction of anesthesia, the uh, uh, intervention was applied. Uh, basically what we did uh, was, a, was to blow up a blood pressure cuff on the arm to uh, 200 millimeters of mercury or 50 millimeters of mercury above the systolic pressure if the patient was uh, uh, hypertensive. The control group received sham uh, RIPC, which was basically putting the blood pressure cuff on, but uh, not inflating it. Uh, it was inflated to about 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, this was done for three cycles with five minutes on, five minutes off, uh, uh, and repeated three times. And then the patient underwent cardiac surgery. The baseline characteristics are shown for you there, and as you can see, there are no differences uh, regarding baseline uh, uh, or operative characteristics between the two groups. Uh, and here are the results. So the outcomes are, the primary outcome was any acute kidney injury within 72 hours of cardiac uh, surgery. Uh, most cases of cardiac surgery induced AKI, of course, happen in the first 24 to 48 hours. Uh, the differences were uh, statistically significant with a reduction in the uh, treatment group uh, to 37% compared to a control group of 52%. Uh, percent. Notice that um, there was uh, no difference in stage one AKI. Uh, the differences were uh, um, uh, confined to more severe uh, acute kidney injury. Now this may have been that uh, some of the mild AKI is not hard carrying AKI, if you will. Um, uh, we have a suspicion that not all stage one is significant. Uh, that may be what's going on. It may also be, though, that some of these uh, cases of more severe AKI became less severe, and some less severe became no AKI. You can't know uh, how that sorts out in the context of a randomized controlled trial like this. Uh, this is also a statistically significant reduction in renal replacement therapy. Uh, there's a reduction in uh, intensive care unit stay by about a day. Uh, so there's a, uh, a significant cost issue uh, there, both in terms of the ICU length of stay as well as renal replacement therapy. But this is where it also gets quite interesting. So not only does the intervention appear to work, it appears to work uh, uh, in association with a significant alteration in uh, some biomarkers and not others. So um, the 
RIPC maneuver increased the cell cycle arrest biomarkers uh, compared to control, but had no effect on urine NGAL, a more uh, of an injury marker rather than a stress marker. And you can see that, uh, that with this increase, uh, the uh, patients who underwent uh, 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 RIPC, who then underwent cardiac surgery, had uh, lower levels of uh, these stress markers compared to um, uh, the patients in the control group. Uh, interestingly, the damage markers show exactly the same sort of um, relationship for the cardiopulmonary bypass exposure, but not for the RIPC exposure. So the intervention induced a increase in the stress biomarkers, but not the damage biomarkers, whereas the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass and the cardiac surgery induce both uh, stress markers and uh, damage markers. However, the patients who already had a bump in their stress markers seem to be protected from subsequent damage. This is uh, breaking this out uh, for you uh, in a little easier uh, way to see. Uh, you can see that the uh, acute kidney injury markers increased early uh, as opposed to late. You can also separate it this way, in which we look at what happens early and late. And you can see there is a complete shift in, in the, between the what happens after uh, remote ischemic preconditioning, which is early, and what happens after cardiac surgery, uh, which is defined here as late. This is another way of looking at it, and this is not in the paper, uh, but we've broken it out as um, uh, looking at the patients who into four groups, because some patients who underwent RIPC still developed AKI, as I showed you, 37%. Um, so I'm breaking it out here as patients who receive the intervention, so intervention positive, AKI negative, intervention positive, uh, AKI uh, uh, negative, uh, intervention negative, or in the control group, developed AKI and intervention uh, negative vis-a-vis uh, -vis in the control group, but uh, didn't develop AKI. And you can see here that uh, uh, patients that were in the RIPC group who didn't develop AKI had this large rise with the intervention and then flat. Whereas if you're in the remote ischemic preconditioning group, interestingly, those patients already had higher levels, which is something that's quite interesting because you wonder do these, were these patients unable to respond to the intervention uh, because they were already uh, at risk for acute kidney injury? They had a little bit of a, of a lift, and there does seem to be some early protection, but it's not enough to cause uh, them to uh, remain free of acute kidney injury, whereas the natural uh, uh, process, the patients who had in the control group who developed AKI look exactly like other studies which have looked at the biomarker as a marker to predict acute kidney injury. This is breaking it out exactly the same way, but now looking at relative differences as opposed to absolute differences. And you can see again that it looks like the patients that received the remote ischemic preconditioning, even if they didn't get protection, there seemed to be a delay in the bump that they receive uh, with the cardiac surgery. So it's possible, therefore, that we could refine this intervention using the biomarker, refine this intervention better, maybe repeat it, maybe increase the intensity, maybe do something else, but poten potentially uh, get these patients to be uh, salvaged uh, from the, the group that would ultimately go on to, to have uh, all right, uh, AKI. So how do we think this works? Well, I've alluded to this sort of all along, but this is the conceptual framework that we have, and this is why we studied this the way we did. Um, we have the hypothesis that by putting uh, this blood pressure cuff on the arm, inflating it, uh, and decreasing it, that there would be some mild ischemia to the muscle, and that the muscle would release myoglobin and HMGB1 and other uh, damage-associated molecular patterns into the circulation. And these molecular patterns would be picked up in minutes by the proximal tube epithelial cells who have pattern recognition receptors there for the express purpose, as far as we know, to detect these signals. And in the process, then engage in this auto-protective mechanism, which we don't fully understand, 
uh, but is in response to this signal. We have essentially pulled the fire alarm, got the building evacuated ahead of the plane crashing into the, uh, into the building, essentially, versus what happens in the sham situation where you have a naive kidney that doesn't ha has not seen this process, and then you have full-blown engagement of the defense mechanism, but it's too late to protect the kidney from, uh, from, uh, from injury. We can test this hypothesis indirectly by measuring certain damage-associated molecular patterns and seeing statistically whether they're correlated with protection, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, we looked at HMGB1. We're in the process of looking at myoglobin and five or six other uh, damage-associated molecular patterns, but this is the urine uh, uh, HMGB1. You can see it increases. Um, uh, it looks like it increases in both groups, although this was uh, not uh, a significant, I don't believe, but this increase uh, was greater in the RIPC group, um, and as a result, it is statistically associated with a increase in the TIMP2 IGFBP7 and a protection from the uh, 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 subsequent acute kidney injury. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, release of HMGB1 has a uh, odds ratio of 0.75. So if you increase your HMGB1 in your, in your uh, plasma and subsequently in your urine, uh, as a result of RIPC, you were protected more from uh, acute kidney injury than if you did not. So in conclusion, remote ischemic preconditioning reduces acute kidney injury after cardiac uh, bypass. Damage associated molecular patterns appear to be released from the RIPC and prime epithelial cells, potentially other cells as well, to induce some protection through mechanisms we don't fully understand. TIMP2 and IGFPP7 in the urine after cardiopulmonary bypass appear to be robust measures of risk for AKI after cardiac surgery. However, remote ischemic preconditioning appears to exploit this mechanism as a therapy by re causing a release early and preemptively and engaging these protective mechanisms. TIMP2 and IGFPP7 may represent the first effective theragnostic for acute kidney injury. And with that, I want to uh, 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 give um, uh, credit um, uh, to uh, Alex Zarbach, who's a PI of this trial, and uh, a cast of, of uh, investigators at uh, the four centers in Germany. Uh, and uh, I get to stand up here and present this as a, uh, as a guy who just got to sit back and help with the study design and the interpretation of the results, and they did all the work. Uh, and so thank you for your attention.